instructors. The Old Testament scriptures and the book of Psalms and chapter 5. The book of Psalms and chapter 5. <clears throat> so you're turning there, and perhaps I can just check. Is this volume quite good? Yes. Do you want? Is it loud enough? Yes. Psalm 5, and um, reading at the beginning. There's a title to the psalm to the chief musician upon Nehilov, a psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil stand with thee, and so on. <clears throat> now, those of you who attended the online prayer meeting last Monday evening will recall that I spoke a little that evening on from this psalm. But uh, the time allotted for addresses on the Monday evening is very short, and I didn't really get beyond the first part of the psalm. I would like this evening to develop these thoughts and to enlarge upon them and take us a little further into the passage. Now, there is no indication of the circumstances which led to the penning of this psalm. We're simply told that it was one of those psalms that was written by David. Now, sometimes, even although we're not told in the title, the, the when and the why uh, of the psalm, sometimes there are clues in the passage itself which lead us uh, perhaps to have some idea of who it is or how it was written. But the content of Psalm 5 yields few clues as to the time of its composition. However, like many of the Psalms, the fifth Psalm is full of prayer. In fact, it's been described by one writer as a tutorial in how to pray in difficult circumstances. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to turn over every stone that we find in this passage. Uh, time won't allow it. But I want to focus on three particular matters in Psalm 5. I want us to notice, first of all, David's words as he prays. David's words as he prays, and I'll make six uh, points about David's words. I want us to notice, first of all, that they are spoken words. They are spoken words. Verse one, give ear to my words, O Lord. He is confiding in the Lord. David is not silent. He is in difficulty, as we'll see in a moment, but he is not in his difficulty keeping it to himself or turning in on himself, as we are sometimes prone to do, but he is bringing it and setting it before the Lord. The Lord does not want his people to be silent. He encourages them to come to him and to speak to him. We have not, we're told in the word, often because we ask not, because the spoken word wasn't there. And he has a confidence that as he comes with his spoken words, God hears his words. Give ear, he says, to my words. He is a God who gives ear to the words of his people, a God with ears toward them, whose ear is open as it says elsewhere, to their cry, and an ear that is not heavy when they come to him in their 
need. Though he is high, yet he regards and he respects those who are low and those who are lonely, uh, lowly. So they are spoken words. Now, you might be saying at this point, does that mean that I must speak aloud to God? No, not at all. Hannah didn't in the passage we read, and she was speaking to the Lord. It's not that they are spoken audibly, but that they are spoken. They may well be spoken audibly, but it is more likely perhaps that they are spoken silently in the heart. But be it silent to others or not, they are spoken to the Lord. They are spoken words. But then secondly, in Psalm 5, we find what's been called broken words. Broken words. Verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Now, sometimes meditation is quiet and pleasant and a generally a happy experience but not here in this context. David's meditation on this occasion was not easy. His circumstances were not straightforward. He is troubled. And he comes with broken words, just as surely as he comes with spoken words to the God who is ready to hear them, just as he heard Hannah's. She came with spoken words in her heart, and she came with broken words in her heart. And that's how David comes here. His meditation is at a time when his spirit is troubled and much difficulty lies in his way. Now, this brokenness is reinforced in the next verse because we're told that he also comes with childlike words. Hearken to the voice of my cry, he says in verse 2. Now, this confirms for us what I was saying a moment ago about broken words. There is a cry here, and it's a cry of, of the child here, my cry. It's not calm. It's not easy words. He is in the midst of difficulty and perhaps even the midst of danger. We don't know. But even as I speak of that cry, we remember another psalm that says his ear is open to their cry. God's eyes are on the just. His ears are open to their cry. Broken words, spoken words, childlike words, Fourthly, we see that they are considered words. Verse 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. Now, it loses something in translation. But the language here has a sense of words that are set in order. He's coming with a, a considered petition. He's coming with something substantial. And he has pondered what he's going to say. It's actually the verb that's used for the showbread being set in order on the table in the tabernacle. Remember the 12 loaves set in order six and six by two. He's thought of what he's going to bring to the Lord. He's setting it out. As he comes, he, he has his reasons ready, as we'll see in a moment. He's going to say in verse 4, for, he's got his reasons. Reinforcing and coming behind his petition. He has his reasons marshaled as he thinks of God's character. He's thought about it. He's thought about God's character. He's thought about God's word and what these things reveal. And he comes in prayer in the light of that. Directed by that. He remembers certain things about God's character. And these truths 
They guide his prayer. They encourage his prayer. Now again, you might be saying, ah, I, I'm afraid I'm losing you, minister. Because sometimes my thoughts are all a jumble when I come in prayer. Will the Lord hear me? Yes, of course he does. Of course he does. But there is a place for ordering our thoughts and our petitions and drawing on what we know about God in our petitions. I'll, I'll say more on that in a moment. Spoken, broken, childlike, considered words. Fifthly, they are mourning words. Mourning words. Verse 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. Before he begins to unravel the problems, he comes to the Lord. Setting the Lord before him, giving him the first place. There's a sermon in that itself. I mustn't stop at it just now. But they are mourning words. And sixthly, they are hopeful words. Verse 3 again. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer to thee and will look up. And will look up. I will pray and I will look up as I pray and I will look up after I pray. You remember the way the metrical version expands on this? It, it actually captures exactly what David is saying. Lord, thou shalt early hear my voice, we sang a moment ago. I early will direct my prayer to thee, and looking up, an answer will expect. An answer will expect. Now, that's not explicit here in the chapter, but it is implicit. And the metrical version catches it very well. These are hopeful words. We'll see why in a moment. But you will notice that the very next thing he says is, Father, because. I will look up because. We'll see what that because is, is in a second. What that because is in a second. They are hopeful words. It's been compared to an arrow shot from a bow and fired at the target. Verse 3 there, I will direct my prayer to thee. It's not a bow adventure. You know the way the scripture speaks of the man who, who fired the bow adventure and just whichever way it goes, it goes. No, it's, it's a target. As he comes with his prayer, his mind enlightened, as we'll see in a moment, by the character of God and what God is like. It's also been compared to a letter sent to a good friend who you know will open the letter and read it and will do anything they can to answer your plea and come to your aid. You know, sometimes you get these letters from charity organizations and they're just sent out wildly to millions of people dear so and so uh, we are a very good charity and we do good work can you please send us some money or give a bank order or something? I, don't know, I don't know what percentage of them they just land in the bin that's completely different to a letter you get handwritten from a friend who says i am in dire straits my situation is very difficult can you help me by doing this or doing that and if you're worth your salt, you will, you will do what you can. You'll be on the phone straight away or maybe in the car and doing what you can. Well, that's a picture we have here. He says, I'm directing my prayer directly to the throne of God, directly to the Lord himself. And looking up, I expect an answer because. Well, David's words as he prays, that leads us secondly to David's encouragements as he prays. And David is encouraged here by two things. By what God is and by what God is like. 
Firstly, by what God is. As he comes in prayer, he's reminded who and what God is. Now, I'm not going to linger on these things, but just to draw your attention to them. In verse 1, he is the Lord. He is the Lord. Now, Lord there is capitalized. L-O-R-D, all capitals. That tells us that it's the name of the covenant God that's there. The God who makes covenant with his people and who keeps covenant. That aspect of God's character is being presented for us here. It's not just anyone. It's God. It's Jehovah. It's the Jehovah of his people. Who has bound himself to his people. I'm coming. And I'm looking up. Because I'm coming to Jehovah. And then in verse 2, not only is he Jehovah, the Lord, but he is the king. He is the king, immortal, invisible, at whose disposal lies all power and all authority, who is able to move kingdoms and divide the sea. Who is able to make all things by the word of his power, who is able to call a universe into being by the word of his power, who says, let there be light, and there is light, who populates the sea in a moment. He is king. And this encourages David as he prays, as he comes with his broken words, he's coming to the king. He is a king who shelters his subjects, who is victorious over his enemy. This is the one, says David, under whose kingly care I have placed myself. Then in verse 2 as well, we see that he is God, the glorious self-existent one. God Almighty. David comes in prayer. And he is encouraged by what God is. He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. And you notice the repeated my in these verses. My God. My king. He's clinging to that covenant relationship. The God who had made him his own. I see. Christian friend, you're not... You're not like the poor Buddhist who comes with their petitions to Buddha who is far off and far away. And, or like the heathen who comes to a God who lives up on top of a mountain maybe. And never comes down and is as unpredictable as, as the weather. You might be your friend today but your enemy tomorrow. No, it is my God, my King. The one I know. This is his encouragement as he prays. But then you see there is a second encouragement. He is encouraged by what God is. And secondly, by what God is like. Now I've already drawn your attention to that word form at the beginning of verse 4. That's a crucial word. Looking up for. For what? For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. In other words, he is a God of goodness. He is a holy God. Now that, of course, brings an element of caution with it. If I regard sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But nevertheless, in this context, God's holiness is an encouragement. Let's just read the verses with this in mind. Thou art not a God that has pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy all them that speak easy. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. He is a righteous God. You imagine David coming. Saul's behind him. Crooked, twisted Saul. And he comes to the Lord in his brokenness. 
and he petitions the Lord for help. And he says, for thou art not a God that delights in wickedness. Not the sort of God that takes the side of the wicked against the righteous. In other words, he is confident that God will do what is right. That he won't have any hidden motives. That he won't be swayed by people's opinion, their favor or their disapproval. You know, governments in the West are often accused of going soft on China. Despite its appalling human rights records and despite the appalling persecution of its people, not least its, its Christian people. But often Western governments will go easily on them because they have a lot of power. A lot of trade with China, so it's played down. We're assured that in private, certain points are made, but made with a feather duster, you sometimes feel. But the Lord is not like that. He is not swayed in that way. He has no part with wickedness. He has no part with what is wrong. You need not feel that he is working against you if you are his. Now let's just take a couple of practical conclusions from that before we go any further. This encourages us as we pray for governments. We pray for governments often. And you sometimes wonder, well, is there any point in praying for governments? Well, yes. And the first word of verse 4 tells you why. For, for God. For God is not a God that has pleasure in wickedness. God is righteous. He's not a respecter of persons. He is good. Let's take that a stage further. It, it encourages us as, as we pray for the removal or the changing of wicked governments. We remember that God is righteous. We're told in verses 9 and 10 that he will put things right. We pray for the removal of wicked governments. In China itself, just to take one example, and many is another part of the world. Many is a wicked government in the Middle East. And it also encourages us to pray for the removal of wicked legislation. Again, at times you feel you've asked for it so often, you know, at any point, you take, for example, legislation covering abortion. Um, and uh, you, you come and pray. And the enemy says, what's the use? Well, verse 4 tells you what the use is. Because God, God is holy. He is not tolerant or weak on any of these things. He is very clear on these things. You are asking for something that is made clear in his will. And that encourages you to press on with it. It encourages us as we pray for the persecuted church. I've touched on this already, but it's worth mentioning again. God is righteous. He abhors wicked and cruelty. Those who shed blood, the cruel man who, who harasses and even tortures others, especially the Lord's people who are the apple of his eye. We're told in verse 11 that he defends them. It encourages us as we pray for the sufferings of God's people generally. He's not indifferent. He's righteous. He's holy. I look up, he said, for. For thou art not a God who has pleasure in wickedness. This was a great encouragement to David. All he knew about God and his character encouraged him as he came in prayer. David's words as he prays, David's encouragements as he prays. Finally, in a word, David's resolve as he prays. As David prays, he makes certain resolutions. He's spoken about others, but in verse 7, he comes back to himself. But as for me. There's another sermon there. As for me. And what does he say about himself? Well, he says several things. First of all, he says, I will come. As for me, 
I will come into thy house. The bad example of others and even perhaps their threats were not going to stop him coming to God's house. Verse 8, we're told that his enemies were, were lurking. Matthew Henry puts it like this. David is steadfastly resolved to keep close to God and to do so publicly. You know, it's an important witness to do it publicly, to come to God's house. We make this point often, don't we? But it's, it is. You might say, well, I can worship the Lord at home. I'm, I'm not dealing here with people who are unwell. Your circumstances dictate. You know that. I, I don't have to add these caveats. But we don't have a problem with this. And that, that's a great blessing. But many places do especially post-COVID, and say, well, I can worship the Lord at home. Yes, you can. But you are not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, Scripture tells you in the first place. In the second place, when you're worshiping God at home, your neighbors don't see it. They don't see you getting, uh, going to the car, don't see you with a Bible, don't see you making your way to church. They haven't a clue what you're doing. The witness is lost. And so it is not something that should be set aside except when circumstances so dictate. That's, that's a different matter. Of course it is. I will come, he says. And then he says, I will come humbly. As for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercies. He's coming on the basis of God's grace. He's not comparing himself to others and saying, as for me, I will come. Am and I good? Well, that's not the spirit of the Christian anyway. The Christian comes humbly, look into Christ, look into his grace. I'm there and it's by God's grace I'm there. It's God's mercy. I will come, I will come humbly, I will come reverently, he says in verse 7. As for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. In thy fear will I worship towards thy holy temple. He's, he's reverent in worship, he's before the king. He's drawn by grace, somebody said, but he's sobered by divine majesty. And there's a balance there. And it's a balance we have to keep in worship. We're drawn by grace. We have a certain boldness. And yet we're sobered by divine majesty. He is a God of grace, but he is God. Andrew Bonner has a story about a Grecian, a Greek painter. And he painted a boy with a basket of fruit on his head. And the, the fruit was so realistic that when the picture was put on public display, the birds came and they were trying to peck at the fruit. And his friend said to the painter, oh, you're some painter, you're really gifted. You know, the birds are trying to peck at the, at the fruit. Oh, he said, I'm not satisfied at all. He said, I should have made the boy so true to life that the birds were frightened to come too close. And there's something of that as we come to the Lord. We come, but we come aware of who he is. I will come. I will come humbly. I will come reverently. Fourthly, and I'm, I'm just finished. I will come purposefully. Verse 8, lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Listen to this now. Make thy way straight before my face. Lead me now, Lord, he said. I've come, now lead me on. You see, his coming to God wasn't just a, a ticking of the box attitude. There, done that. If I can put it like this, his coming should now be reflected in his going. Having come to the Lord, he goes away in a different frame of mind. We find that in Hannah's case. I don't have time to enlarge on that either, but we find that in Hannah's case. Lead me, he says, in thy righteousness. It's been compared to the Lord's prayer. Lead us not into temptation. 
Deliver us from evil. Make thy way straight, mercy, before me. Sometimes it feels like it's not a straight way. But he is able to make a straight way for you as he did for Hannah. Even although it may seem very difficult. Well, if I had time, we would have looked at verse 12, where David closes with confidence as he reflects once more upon God's character. Perhaps Saul or some other enemy was, was closing in. But God was his shield. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. So what do we have? Well, like David, we come with a prayer of verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. With the confidence of verse 4. For thou art a God of justice. With the resolve of verse 7. As for me, I will come. And the confidence of verse 12, thou wilt compass him about as with a shield. David's words as he comes, his encouragements as he comes in prayer, his resolve as he prays. May God bless his word to our hearts. We're going to sing now in the words of Psalm 5, the remaining verses. Alistair, Passion, you lead us in the singing, please, Alistair. Um, Psalm 5, and we're at verse 8. We'll sing 8 through 12. Psalm 5, verses 8 through 12. I shan't read them, read them together, in part at least, because of those mine enemies. Make Amen. Yeah. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.